My name is Cindy Kaufman. I'm Vice President of Marketing for Mannington Commercial. I'm Byron Morton, Vice President and Co-Head of Leasing for The Mart. And I'm Amanda Schneider, host of this podcast. Together with my co-hosts, we'll be sharing a highlight reel of all eight episodes from this season. Think of this as your hashtag TLDR for Design Nerds Anonymous Season 5. We get it, you're busy, so we want to make this easy on you. Now, if you're an avid fan and you've already listened to all eight episodes this season, we hope this is a great reminder of some of the best moments or perhaps a succinct way to share with a colleague. Or if this is the first you're hearing of these topics, we hope to inspire you to go back in your podcast feed and listen to the full episode on your favorite topic. First up, Byron's favorite episode this season, episode one culture but with the authors of how the future works and with Gensler. I don't think that comes as a surprise given that my parent company is one of the largest class A landlords in Manhattan. That episode really landed with me because it confirms everything that we've been doing at Fornado. One, to make our buildings themselves more attractive to companies through the work-life amenities that we've been introducing at Pen One and that we just debuted at the Mart during Neocon in June. And two, the reason people come to work now, we all know have changed. And I thought that episode really did a great job of outlining how we need to start thinking of the office as a gathering place and a place, frankly, that, that builds culture and almost dovetails into every episode in the season, really. As you heard, episode one is all about culture. In this episode, we tackled the number one challenge facing many modern workplaces, how to create a strong company culture without relying solely on a physical office. Our guest experts in chapter one are two of the authors of the book, How the Future Works, who shared insights from their research as part of the recently shuttered Future Forum. They provide practical tips for improving how we work both in and out of the physical office, and they explain the new key to a thriving culture. And I'll give you a hint, it is not what you think. Then in chapter two, we unite with multi-generational design experts from Gensler, the number one interior design giant of design firm. Here are some of our favorite quotes, starting with Sheila's answer to why the office today is so important and how that's shifting. Why is the office today important and how is that shifting? What we are seeing from the data is that it's not that going digital first means that the office is dead. It means that it's taken on a new role. What we see from our research is that three fourths of people who do want to connect regularly and go into the office want to do so to foster connection, to collaborate, to build camaraderie. And Amanda, for your audience specifically, we spent 20 years as leaders and organizations decreasing the average square foot per employee by 50%, putting more people into open office floor plans. What we need to do is flip the 60, 70% of the office that was for heads down work to being 60 to 70% for heads up work for the interactions that we want people to have together in the time they want to spend. And the good news is people want to do that. The vast majority of people don't want a fully remote experience in the same way that the vast majority of people don't want a fully in the office experience. The older generations and the traditional workplace is set up to only do that mentorship and that culture building in person. So until the way we work and the way we build culture in our offices can be translated to a virtual environment, there is that need and that push for younger generations to go into the office. Clearly, everything is pointing to the act of work being purpose-driven and quality-driven. And it says to me, Amanda and Isabel, that the future of work, that hybrid work, that digital first, that the physical environment are all becoming equal tools in the toolbox of choice. Next up, episode two is all about creativity. In this episode, we asked, how can we keep the creative spark alive in this increasingly fast-paced era? Our guest expert in chapter one was Natalie Nixon, a creativity strategist for the C-suite, author of the book, The Creativity Leap, 
and one of the top 50 keynote speakers in the world. Then, in Chapter 2, we apply her insights with design experts from Canon Design. Here are some of our favorite moments. When we spoke to leadership, one of the things that they talked about was this Pinterest era, how access to all these digital tools from a design standpoint, especially interior design standpoint, is really creating these homogenous designs. And then when we spoke with our young Gen Zers about how we combat this challenge around creativity, they said, you know what, it's not what you think. Digital access is a really good thing. The culprit here is a lack of time. How do we build in time to make sure that we can replenish that creativity bucket? I love the distinction that these younger people are making about the technology truly being a catalyst, a collaborator. I wrote something very similar in a recent article for Fast Company about artificial imagination and looking at chat GPT as a co-conspirator, a collaborator, a catalyst. And their point about needing time for deep thought and deep work is essential. It's on the firm, but it's also on the individual to foster that for themselves. I don't see creativity coming out of stagnation, right? I love it when people travel. Please take your PTO and go somewhere cool because you're not only going to be rested, but you're also going to have seen things that you hadn't seen before and you're going to be able to come back and be inspired to create. I do see a lot of value in technological advances and new opportunities to create. We're still in the beginning stages of figuring out how these tools can really fully benefit us, but we're already starting to see some really cool stuff out there. And with AI, <laughs> people see it in different perspectives, but I think it's, again, time. Something we've notice about AI is how fast you can create something with that tool. And maybe that is something that we can take into account when we are starting to create visuals for our clients. As an example, these things typically take a lot of time to develop. And that tends to take time from those creativity hours that you need to develop the project. Moving on to episode three. Mentorship. Is mentorship dead? You've likely heard of the Great Resignation, the Great Renegotiation, or as Gallup has called it, the Great Discontent. One of the biggest challenges we are hearing not only in our industry, but globally, is the loss and lack of talent and the challenge to retain, recruit, and connect a company's biggest asset, their people. So what can leaders and companies do to increase employee engagement and support their managers? And how do we do mentorship effectively today? The voice you just heard was from my coworker, Jess Jenkins, one of the co-hosts of the industry's first CEU accredited podcast, The Learning Objective. On this episode, we featured a replay of a recent episode where we tackled the intriguing question, is mentorship dead? Now, Think Lab data suggests effective mentorship is one of the topics that has perplexed many firms for years. Now, accelerated by increasing hybrid work, this topic has reached a boiling point. The truth is, everyone is struggling with the traditional apprenticeship model of mentorship built from our analog world. So, join Think Lab and Technion as we explore new opportunities to help firms navigate healthy connections across all generations. From reverse mentorship and shadow boards to sponsorship and champions, this episode will help leaders challenge the way that it's always been done and leave you with actionable ideas to build and enhance their teams and even your DEI initiatives. And you'll earn CEU credits just for listening in. So if that interests you, I'd encourage you to go back in your podcast feed and listen in to episode three. Up next is episode four, which is all about the critical importance of belonging in a fidgetal world. And if you haven't heard that term fidgetal, it's physical plus digital kind of slammed together in a new concept we call fidgetal. In chapter one, 
We're joined by Megan Henshaw, global event strategist with tech powerhouse Google. She runs their Experience Institute, which you'll see written as Google XI. It's an internal and external innovation effort focused on exploring and reimagining human-centered, multimodal experience design. Megan has been spearheading groundbreaking initiatives to cultivate a sense of belonging in both the physical and digital realms, finding innovative ways to bridge the two. Together, we explore their beta test of the Belonging Index, which identifies what belonging means to people based on over 750,000 surveys in 152 languages across 180 countries. Then in chapter two, we'll apply these insights with workplace experts from Nelson. We'll explore how Megan's insights on creating belonging can evolve our approach to the workplace. Here are some of our most compelling clips. You said belonging is good for business. So tell us about some of those big ahas that you've uncovered, maybe a few little nuggets that have surprised you that led you to some of those conclusions. 40% of people globally feel isolated at work, which I think is one of the data points that was just staggering to me. We're spending about $8 billion in the United States alone on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives every year, largely that don't move the needle because the thing that is missing, the linchpin there, is people feeling as if they belong. A couple other data points that are really interesting is that people are 167% more likely to recommend a brand and organization if they feel like they belong within the way that environment is cultivated. It absolutely matters to business. I don't love to lean into the business value metrics, but I think depending on stakeholders, that's important. There's a real human impact here as well. So why is this topic so important right now? I would say one of the biggest things that I'm discussing with clients lately is we've all seen the research coming out of the pandemic and during when people were asked what it was that they missed, it was always people. Never were they saying that they missed the physical office space. They were never saying that they missed a specific piece of equipment. It was always that they missed the human connection. And I think even now with the flexibility, people having the ability to come back and be together, people are choosing different days, different times. There's still that sense of loneliness when you show up to the office on your one of three days a week and you realize you're one of two people and the other person is all the way on the other side of the office. So I think this discussion is almost more important now than it was before because we were all separated and alone for so long. We were so excited to come back because what we were missing was that human connection. And now when we are coming back, we don't have it in the way that we were expecting. To jump off of that, I think my generation specifically, I graduated from college last year and so in 2022, and we never really got the experience prior to the pandemic. So when we're straight out of college, jumping right into the work field, we never had anything to compare it to. And I think that's something really important to note, especially as somebody who works remote. I never had that experience of what it's like to be in the office. So I never knew what I was missing. This is pretty much all I've known since graduating and being in the workforce. We often spend more time, whether it's in person or virtual, with people we work with than we do with our families. And most of our companies, our competitors do very similar work. Really, the thing that distinguishes our organization from anyone else's or vice versa is the people that we have. So you have to really enjoy the people that you work with and feel like you're part of something that matters. And I truly think when we're talking bigger picture now about how to bring people back to the office, it's people that are bringing people back to the office. It's not how the office is designed. That can help, but that can't solve it. Fifth in Line was our episode on learning, and it happened to be one of Byron's favorites this season. Another episode that really stood out to me was episode five on learning and insights from Gen Z with Megan Grace and with Stan Tuck. And that really gave one of the best definitions of digital native and analog native that I've heard. 
and as a, as an analog native myself, the the whole idea that you know, relate to the world from a certain perspective based on how you grew up with technology really stood out to me. And as a middle-aged manager, I'm trying to translate my skills in a way that, that Gen Z understands. We explored the age of lifelong learning by looking at insights from Gen Z to inspire new mindsets that benefit all generations. Megan Grace joined us in chapter one. She's a researcher, host of the podcast, hashtag Gen Z, and author of several books on Gen Z. In chapter two, we explored the application of her ideas with multi-generational leaders from Stantec. Together, we examine research-backed wisdom on the strategies and mindset shifts that empower all generation to thrive in this era of rapid change. All right, here we go. We have to look at that really unique context that's gonna change the way that their behaviors as humans will be different than previous generations. One of those being for Generation Z is the heavy involvement of technology. They've never lived an entire day of their conscious life without the internet being accessible. Previous generations have recollection. And so when I think about learning and when I think about Generation Z specifically, that's such an important marker of when we think about what learning truly is, it is taking information, it is taking concepts, it is comprehending them. It is applying them and then it's integrating it into our lives, behaviors, perspectives. So it's deeply rooted in how we navigate information and relationships. And so when you just break it down to that, Gen Z has a super unique context, familiarity, comfort level with learning in spaces that previous generations had no concept of. The only way you could learn stuff way back when was like reading a book on your own, maybe watching a VHS tape and interacting with a teacher. And that's where we've seen this democratization of information, this widespread nature of information and connection that is really fundamentally changing how we design learning environments. And it's changing the way and the role of instructors. What advice do you think firms, our industry, our clients should implement based on some of these discussions? I think for me, it's just having a buddy to guide you and lead you through things that you may not understand. You can slack them a question really quick or get a quick response. I think it's more having that person that you can lean on that will support you in your career from the early beginning and be with you throughout. It's remembering that as much as Gen Z are really good at being self-advocates for what they need and what they want, there's some business aspects that they may not know that they need to advocate for themselves or how to do that. Moving on to episode six, where we explored gamifying career paths. It's no secret that many perceive Gen Z as less loyal. So we explored how gamification can engage and motivate Gen Z, but also ripple up to foster growth and success for all generations. In chapter one, we're joined by one of our Gen Z authors this season, Rohan Shahi. In his book, The Z Factor, How to Lead Gen Z to Workplace Success, Rohan busts myths about what motivates this generation in the workplace and provides strategies for creating cultures that bridge generational gaps and promote growth and success for everyone. Then in chapter two, we explore these ideas with Perkins and Will, who will share some of their own projects and how they're applying these ideas. Here are some of our favorite moments. One of the things I hear frequently is that Gen Z lacks loyalty. What has your research said about that? Two things. One is that this perceived lack of loyalty isn't just rooted in Gen Z. It seems like every generation now has a shorter tenure at each of these companies. So it's just a society-wide trend that people don't need to spend their whole lives at a company. I think for Gen Z, what it is, if there is a continued value add to being a part of a company, We are more than happy to stay at this company. I think there is just more of a lower barrier of friction to learning new things and picking up new skills thanks to a rise in technology and a familiarity with this technology. There isn't so much of an emphasis placed on what the employer can do for the employee. Really, the dynamic has changed. The employee has a little bit more power. They feel more empowered to explore things if it's not working out for them. 
What advice do you think our industry should be implementing based on what we're learning? I think that concept of gamifying a career is really important because frequently acknowledging checkpoints in between these milestones in your career is really important, but a company can't realistically reward employees fiscal year by title promotion for every achievement, right? So how do we give people acknowledgement for their different milestones? And what I really took away from the research and interviews and a lot of these conversations about Gen Z is that I think celebration is really a key solution and something that I've found successful at Perkins and Will. And this ties back to that recommendation of not pitting peers against each other. Create a culture in which employees are excited about each other's achievements and want to learn more about them. Almost there. Episode seven of eight is all about purpose and was another of Cindy's favorite episodes. And I have to add one of the most emotional interviews that I've ever done. Listen in and you'll hear why. One of the ones that really stuck out to me was the episode around purpose. I know that at Mannington Commercial, we are really working hard to expand our efforts, not just around sustainability, but around greater transparency into what we're doing. We are very open. We just entered the climate agreement with the United Nations. What I love about this idea of purpose, and especially in the context of our industry, is that designers are driven by their internal passion and who they are, whether they label it as this or not, to make the world a better place, to make spaces more inhabitable and more meaningful and more relevant and support our lives in better ways. So I loved that idea of purpose and unlocking the potential of a workforce. I think the way you unlock the potential of a workforce is by allowing individuals to unlock their individual potential. And if you can bring teams of people together that are doing that, that's when you have lightning in a bottle. As Cindy mentioned, we explored the transformative impact of purpose in the workplace and in our lives. In chapter one, we're joined by Akhtar Bajcha, author of The Purpose Mindset, How Microsoft Inspires Employees and Alumni to Change the World. He shares practical strategies and inspiring stories to help you unlock the true potential of your workforce. Then in chapter two, we explored the application of these ideas through personal stories from two designers at DLR Group. Together, we gain valuable insights into creating a purpose-driven culture that fosters motivation, satisfaction, productivity, and most importantly, personal fulfillment. We hope you're moved by the deep emotion in this episode. You helped create and augment one of the most successful philanthropic campaigns in history. I think the Microsoft story tops over 2 billion at the time of writing this book. What would you want leaders that are trying to activate their people around creating a culture of purpose to know about your story and what they can take away. The journey of the book was to actually look Microsoft's philanthropic endeavors, because I felt that it was an untold story of Microsoft's impact in the community. As I was finishing the book, we went into lockdown because of the pandemic, and that changed my thinking completely in how people showed up for their community. And see what it made me realize that purpose is not about philanthropy or giving back. Purpose is just how you choose to live your life. As we started doing workshops in companies and corporations, giving back and philanthropy was not important. What was important is are your people showing up As an individual, do you recognize your strengths, your values, and your purpose? And have you articulated it? And are you willing to live it? That purpose is much more important, even for the company's success. Because at the end of the day, the company does not exist to extract. We've got to give back and leave something of value. I think one thing that stuck out to me is truly the word passion and how he changed that P word in his interview. And I think it's something that as a leader, I'm like, how do you create 
passion for your employees? How do you create passion that engages beyond just what we're doing, but in what we do and how we're really creating spaces and environments that evoke passion in others? Sometimes when you blend passion with work and it's so much, it can be easy to get burnout. So can we briefly just throw that bomb on the table and see where that one goes? I don't want to sound like a motivational speaker or anything like that, but I hope someone tries to make me burn out because I, I have a strong why. And I'm not going to give away the most emotional part of this interview, but let me encourage you to go back and hear directly from Lennis about his why and the way he's putting that into action at DLR Group and on behalf of our industry. And finally, episode eight is all about relationships. In perhaps our most provocative episode of the season, we explore the secrets to developing trust and connection as we dive into Gen Z's unique approach to building trust. In chapter one, we interview expert guest, Hannah Grady Williams. She's our other Gen Z author this season. She is a TEDx speaker and a self-proclaimed Gen Z advisor to CEOs. She reveals the surprising dynamics of face-to-face interactions in a digitally native generation. And if you've not listened to her TED Talk yet, I would encourage you to Google it, find it, and do so. We'll put a link in the show notes as well. Then in chapter two, we unpack these insights with multi-generational design experts from HKS. So without further ado, let's dive in. Here's Hannah. I came out very boldly and said that we are living in a world now with two distinct categories of human. We have the native digital and the native analog. And I believe this is the most instrumental distinction for business leaders and marketers to understand and specifically talent leaders. There's so much to unpack here, but basically it's this idea that native digital humans who are roughly under age 30, and then you have native analog humans who are simply people who have the real world as their first primary life experience and their digital life is secondary. And they're usually roughly over the age of 35. And then you have digital immigrants who are in the middle, depending on how they were raised, et cetera. So essentially this premise is saying, we have a new category of human the native digital, which I'm a part of, where we literally have a primary life experience that's digital and a secondary life experience that's analog or the real world. Meaning that unlike my parents' generation, as an example, we simply see the world from the digital lens first and the analog lens second. The way I like to describe it is, If someone is a native to, let's say, South Korea, if they're a native, they've come from family there, they've lived there for 20, 30, 40 years of their life, then they're a native South Korean, right? If you or I, Amanda, were to go to South Korea after living in America for 30 or 40 years and said, I'm going to become a South Korean, I'm going to acclimate to their music, their culture, their traditions, and I'm going to be a South Korean and I make the claim, I am a native South Korean, we would all laugh at you, right? Like you can't be a native South Korean after living in America for 30 years. So in the same way, we have a generation now that is native to digital. And there's all sorts of extrapolations we could get into of how that plays out. Gabby, one thing you took away from the interview with Hannah. I definitely took away, not only from the podcast, I watched the TED Talk and I shared it with a few of our Gen Zers in the office as well to get their takeaway. And one of the biggest things was challenging the idea of the corporate ladder and how that relates to our industry as well, which is very, what's the next step? What's the next goal you have in your career and how they're coming in and they're challenging that in a way. There's so much potential and energy with Gen Z, their creative force. And I think if they are not brought to the table in a a healthy, equally respectful, two-way type communication with leadership, a lot of these firms are going to be left in the past with the way that they're approaching design, a way that they're thinking about and embracing technology and solutions. So I think it's there is so much work to do in our industry for firms to recognize this, build a culture where it can be celebrated and people can thrive. Mm-hmm. 
So as we bring this highlight reel to a close, I want to bring back my co-hosts for this episode, Cindy and Byron, so you can hear their passion directly for bringing this research and insight to your ears. So I asked them, how does your work at Mannington Commercial, The Mart, and Neocon tie into these topics about Gen Z? And what excites you about getting this information to your clients? A great deal of our design customers are in this age bracket. And while there are challenges with how things have been in the past and where we currently stand and struggling to get people into the office, Mannington Commercial's role at this point needs to not just be a provider of flooring solutions, but we need to be an educator and we need to be a Sherpa and we need to guide them and help them understand why their selections are so important and so impactful, not just on the client and the budget and the timeline, but on the ultimate occupant of the space that they're designing, really thinking of the true use of that space and how does the design of that space have ultimately a very powerful impact on the people who exist in that space on a daily basis, whatever that space may be in healthcare, if it's a healing environment, if it's education and it's a learning environment, people are experiencing different things and how does the the holistic design but specifically for Mannington Commercial, how does the flooring support what's going on in that space? And young designers have a lot of responsibility on their shoulders. Amanda, you were the one that quoted that statistic to me about the power. Yeah, let let me rephrase that. So it was um, the average interior designer has 26 times the specification power as the average American consumer has buying power. And when you get into the interior design, giants of design, it's 111 times on average. And according to Metropolis, one of our sister brands, the interior design industry will have influence over one tenth of the world's carbon emissions by 2050. Yeah, this young generation has this massive responsibility on their shoulders and power that comes with that to make the right decisions and make the right choices that not only impact the people that work and live and play in those spaces, but also the future of our planet. It's a massive responsibility. So we as Man- at Mannington Commercial want to partner with them and help educate them and lead them and guide them. It's not just about selling products. That's not solely why we exist. But this generation is going to see the world change perhaps even more than our generation has. And Technology aside, I think they're going to see, you know, the earth change and um, workplace is still changing. This is a, a generation of people that are going to have a very broad impact on all of our lives and on the planet. So it, I think we need to pay very close attention to what they're doing and, and align ourselves with the right values and the, the way to support them in making these big decisions. Mannington is very attuned uh, and focused on helping this generation really become the best that they can be in an industry that has a lot of power over our lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a piece of that is helping those individuals make better decisions, but also helping these entities evolve to help those young individuals thrive and learn all of these things that they need to. I think that's what excites me about this is these are direct challenges for the interior design industry where we are all struggling in our businesses to incorporate this next generation, but that exponential power is going to be extended to their clients as well. I approach that question from two perspectives. The first perspective is as a landlord that leases showrooms and produces a trade show for the design industry. All of these subjects really apply not only to the workplace into Gen Z, but how event venues and design events are still so very important for people to be in person because the events really support the culture of our industry. They support mentoring, they support relationships. One of the largest reasons that people come to Neocon beyond seeing new products is for the networking. As I look at it from another perspective, as a landlord and and an asset manager, every single episode 
in this season has relevance to operation of an office, design of an office, and design of a building in itself. At Vorneo, what we've really tried to do is we're really looking to provide an environment wherein our tenants can thrive and their employees can thrive. And that ties into every single important subject in the design industry, including sustainability, including wellness, including authenticity, back to where Cindy started. And we're really passionate about that. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, so it's fun to see all those things that we're talking about in this episode apply in a different perspective, maybe not just specifically towards the design industry. So in our last couple of minutes together, as we look forward to 2024, because we're getting ready to kick off our next hackathon, we're getting ready to dive into our next major season. Is there anything as you're looking to the future that kind of excites you that you would love the opportunity to bring to your clients? Are there any topics on the horizon that you'd love us to explore next? One of the things that we are really aimed at moving forward, especially starting in 2024, is creating more live engagement with our customers specifically, getting back into their offices, but honestly, getting them out of their offices. And whether that means being in one of our showrooms or being someplace completely different, how do we connect with our customers in a way that extends beyond helping them understand our products, which is vitally important to our business, but at the same time, how do we support and engage and build relationships with our customers in a deeper way? I am about to actually add a member to the marketing team at Mannington Commercial, and that role is going to be an experienced marketing manager. And that person is going to focus solely on creating live, unique experiences and all of our other experiences with our customers. We are so dedicated to it and so focused on it for 2024 and beyond that we're getting ready to bring someone on our team to focus on it alone. I can help. <laughs> Funny story, as we look to our 2024 hackathon is we started these hackathons as part of Sandow in 2020, in the height of the pandemic. And all of them have been fully virtual to date. And our 2024 hackathon is actually going to be a series of IRL events. So Byron, don't worry, we're going to be reaching out to you as well about uh, venues and showrooms. <laughs> I think some of the things that, that really excite me that we seem to be looking into in 2024 are more exploration into Gen Z and the whole concept of fidgetal, which I know is a, a phrase that I think you may have coined and how we can make time for the design industry and for all of us, frankly, to absorb everything that's available to us in the digital world, but still combine and integrate that with our physical experiences. We hope you've enjoyed this mixtape of key moments this season. But there's so much more. If this sparked something for you, I want to personally encourage you to go back and give the full episode a listen. Better yet, share it with a colleague that you think can benefit. Design Nerds Anonymous is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Discover more shows from Surround at surroundpodcast.com. This episode of Design Nerds Anonymous was produced and edited by Sandow Design Group. Special thanks to the podcast production team, Hannah Vitti, Wise Grisette, Rachel Senator, and Samantha Sager. <laughs>